here. Today is 921 of the year 2022. If you're listening to this, you are uh, we're in the future, we're in the past. We're in the past. It's like taking a time machine back to the past. Today we're going to be learning about how to write up an as is offer. Let me close some of my thousand windows here. Sorry. Should have done this before I clicked over, except I don't want to do that. All right. So, how to get into form simplicity? I've gotten this question a lot. They're already saying low, uh, low, low something. I'm going to get closer, a little closer to the Wi Fi here. Excuse me one second. So, I've gotten this question a lot like, how do I get to the forms? Where are the forms located? So, depending on what your preference is, if you like transaction desk, if you like form simplicity, it's completely up to you of which way you get into the forms or which forms you go to. Okay, but there's no forms on RSA. I understand in Illinois, that's a thing. There are no forms on RSA. I shouldn't say that. There are some, some forms on RSA. For the most part, if you're writing up an offer, those forms are not gonna be on RSA. They're gonna be through your MLS. So there's a couple of different ways to access them. You come down here. This is not what I'd recommend if you were writing up an offer or even a listing, um, but this is one way to access, okay? Log into Form Simplicity, log into Transaction Desk. Also, when you're going into your matrix, if you do have matrix, you can a lot of times go, instead of going to the matrix, um, if I'm making any sense, you can you can log in from there. There's little tiles and stuff like that that, that are available. I typically don't go that way. I'm gonna show you the way I go. So if I'm in 717 Glen Oaks, because my client said, hey, I like this property. I want to write up an offer on it. And this is this is where I'm going to go. So this is form simplicity. OK, you can use transaction desk. You can use form simplicity. But the app that I choose to use is form simplicity. So I have more knowledge and education on that. So if you're going to call me about something on transaction desk, I'd be like, I don't know. We can figure it out together. But I don't know off the top of my head. Most of the things on form simplicity I know off the top of my head because of the offers I've written up and I, I just kind of know how to go through it. So you come here, <coughs> excuse me. You come here and then you just kind of make sure the information is correct. Now, I generally trust that it is and I've had addendums that we've had to write up because it's wrong, because the legal description is wrong, because the, the partial ID number is wrong. So how do you check those things? So if you go over here, Click on the little tax dealy. Okay. Now, actually, I wouldn't I wouldn't correct it at this point because it just pulls it directly from the MLS. So you're going to be getting the same information. Okay. But if you scroll down and you go to the actual tax website, which I know how to get through through Realist, but I don't know how to get there through here. So, and if I open Realist, it's going to kick me out of form simplicity. So let's do it anyway. Okay, so if I go, if I'm on the listing and I click on this little, looks like a government building is what I call it. Like, uh, you know, I'm sure there's there's a name, the Parthenon or some, something like that. But I just say it looks like a government building to me, you know, tax something, sure. So I click on that. Notice up here, it kicked me out of form simplicity. Darn you, but there's a way that we can get through this. It's okay. So then you come down here, you click on this button right here, which Freddie Rodriguez taught me this. You click on this, it takes you right to the tax assessor's office. Because I normally do business in Orange County, so I know where all those links are and how to look that up, but Lake County, not so familiar with me. Okay, so now we got the stuff. Okay, so let's look here. So this is the partial ID. Now this is just the partial ID that led us here. Let's make sure that this property address is lining up with the parcel ID. So we're good with that. The parcel number, I keep calling it the parcel ID. Um, and then you get the property description. So now let's go back. Now we can go back to this and go back into form simplicity. So I, I jumped ahead. Oh, see what it did up here again? All right. So how do we do this? How do we figure this out, people? What should we do? Because chances are, you know, I guess you could print it up. That's one option. 
Let's talk about another option though. Let's do it this way. Do, 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 do. All right, so here we go. Let's click on this again. All right, let's do this. Let's use the snipping tool, which most of you have this on your computer. Go. Cool. You can do it. There we go. Oh, 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 nice. Okay. It's coming. It's coming. You just got to be patient. All right. We hit new. All right. We snip this bad boy. Okay. Now we got it. Now it's going to save it in the background under the snipping tool right here. We're going to minimize it to get out of the way. We're going to go back into form simplicity. All right. <clears throat> From here, let's get that out of the way. You can drag this over here. You can minimize this. Pull this up, do a side by side, and then we got it. Right? So we're scrolling down. We're making sure the information is correct as we're going through this. Okay. So 1919 one forty, nineteen nineteen twenty four zero one forty, zero 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 V one three zero zero. Ah, love it. Okay, the next thing here is the legal description, Pembroke phase IE sub lot V's and Victor thirteen P thirty four PGS fifty seven dash fifty eight ORB thousand. Wait a minute. I miss something? ORB 2017. ORB 5973, page 18. Hmm. It's not the same. So, what I would do is take it from here, make it look exactly the same as the tax records, all right? Because that's the legal property description. So let's go back. I'm going to do page 18. Renee Kelly wants to get in. Okay, page 18, because most of it's correct. ORB. ORB 5973. Right, 58. And then this is different. All right, got it. Page, pages 57, 58, ORB 5973, page 18. Okay. Does that look good, everybody? All right. I'm going to imagine everybody said yes simultaneously and they canceled each other out. And that's why. We got something in the chat. I have no sound. I'm sorry, Lee Wilson. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, really. Um, oh, I think you said that earlier. Good morning, everyone. Yes. Jerry said yes. My one participant said yes. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. So association fees, this is a three bed, two bath, two sound, uh, $217 per month for association fees. Looking, 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 seller's name. Well, we know the seller's name. It's right there. Okay. So AJX Homes. F L L L C. Okay. Then party name, blah, blah, blah. Agent name, Denise Porter. That's the listing agent. Okay, cool. That's her email address. What else? Broker name, Fred Rodrigo. What's up? Purchase price. So, what do I want to offer for the purchase price? So, this one is listed at 275. Hey. Market's a little negotiable, so maybe we want to go in at 270. All right, buyer's name. Nah, that'll be confusing. Um, Renee Kelly. I know this is a 55 plus community. I'm just using your name because that's one of the last ones that popped up on my screen. So, no problem. <laughs> All right. I'm not I'm not suggesting you're even old enough to live here. You know. Well, actually I am. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's fine. That's fine. I don't know why I said it like that. 
Um, okay, and then I would put in your email address. I'm just gonna make it up. Okay, her email address has been protected to uh, for, for the innocent. Now, the phone number, fax number, cell phone number, it's not gonna show up anywhere on the contract. It's not going to help anything as far as e-signing goes. So I don't, I don't fill it in, right? I don't put the, 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 the address. You can put in the address. It will show up on the contract, but I don't, I don't put that in there. Uh, and then the buyer's agent auto-populates. This is my information, right? We scrolly, scrolly down. Office address, broker's name, Freddie Rodriguez. What's up, Freddie? All right. So we don't want to do that. We want to, same as the address. Okay, so we're naming this transaction now. We're going to have a file folder within our transaction, within our form simplicity, and this is naming it. Okay, so we got residential, we got purchase, save as a new transaction. That's going to do its thing. It's going to come down here, and most of you are going to be looking at the full screen, not the split screen at this point. So you can customize your ad form package okay but for our purposes i don't want to because i want your participation in what forms we should use so let's do it so we are going to use what what purchase contract are we going to use to write this up somebody who's been here before as is as is, as is. yes sir thank you tom Time for the win. All right. As is, as is residential. Bah, 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 bah. We want to see the as is dash six. Okay. That's the one right there. Okay. So we clicky clicky. And we go in there and we can modify it. So let's do it. Okay. So Renee Kelly is buying this from AJX Homes F L L L C. And we know this information is correct because we already checked it against the tax records. All right, so this right here. So I go, this is personal. This is about the personal property, this paragraph right here. Okay, it's about the personal property, D, paragraph D. Okay, so it's got the range, oven, refrigerator. I'm not gonna read them all. Dishwasher, disposal, ceiling fans, light fixtures, drapery rods, this, this and that and the other thing, okay? Television, wall mounts, okay? Make sure you read it. You know what's included as a listing agent if you're listing this property. I think we have a question in the chat. Why did you use the as is? Because that's the one we use here. Now, in your area, Freddie, help me out. Um, in your area, uh, St. Augustine, I think they use the NIFAR. There's a NIFAR contract, but ultimately it's the listing agent's choice. I have a lot of background noise. I'm sorry to hear that. Maybe tell everything in your background to be quiet. Um, I'm going to stay on mute. Cool. Um, okay, so. Hey, Jeremy. Yes, sir. So uh, I heard you chime me in asking. So uh, to answer um, Jerry's question, um, 95% of Florida or 95% of the time we use the as is contract. It's a matter of preference uh, which contract you use, but since 2007 or eight, that is the prominent contract that we use throughout the state of Florida. Um, I do see agents in the Jacksonville area up that Northeast corridor um, using some local purchase contracts and addendums, which are also available in here. Um, if you're part of that board, uh, and, and that's just a matter of custom, you know, local custom uh, and, and preference, to be honest with you. The as is, the difference between the as is and the other residential purchase contracts that the state offers, not the local ones, is basically has to do with inspections and repairs and that type of stuff. The as is, is uh, the reason why it's most commonly used is because it gives the most options to both buyer and seller without holding anybody's hand to the fire, really. Uh, what I mean by that is, um, 
for example, on an inspection, if the buyer wants something repaired, even though it is as is, they can ask for it. And if the seller says no, then the buyer can back out of the contract, even though it is being sold as is and vice versa for the seller. All right. So there's contingencies in the as is that allows both of the parties to get out of the contract, obviously in a timely manner, they have to follow procedures and everything else that's on the contract. But uh, I hope that explains it. It does very well, Freddie. Thank you so much. As always, you're a wealth of knowledge. We appreciate you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So, so D, I, I don't know, like anybody who knows me normally knows I'm very sarcastic, but Freddie is like, he he's, he knows so much just off the top of his head. And and I, for one, really appreciate him. So that's sincere, Freddie. I wasn't, I wasn't being sarcastic at all. No, um, I know that, Jeremy. Thanks. And it's highly appreciated. Uh, one, just one more note, uh, that, that contract actually became prevalent in the state of Florida, like I said, back in 2007 and eight, when the market crashed and the bank had a whole bunch of foreclosures, these are the contracts that the bank was requesting, all the banks were requesting. So it became pretty prominent in Florida because like I said, it's pretty lenient both ways to buyer and seller. One more question, because I, I frequently get this one a lot. Um, so because it's named as is, it means the property's as is. They can't ask for any repairs, right? Well, I, I said that before. They can ask for repairs. Buyer can ask for repairs. Okay. Uh, I just want to, uh, so, to bring that up because I, I hear that all the time. So this is as is, so I can't ask for anything, right? And I'm like, no, that's not what the contract says. It just no, you can definitely ask. Everything's negotiable. Remember that. Yeah. Um, on the other purchase contract, the seller actually has a money limit up to where he has to do repairs. Uh, so it kind of holds the seller obligated to do certain repairs up to a certain dollar amount, which is why most people like to use the as is because it gives the seller leniency whether he wants to do repairs or not want to do repairs. Does that make any sense? It absolutely does. Um, um, yeah, the, you can definitely ask for repairs no matter what contract you're using. So I have a question on that, on the as is. Uh, if if there's a property that has a deck and the deck is falling apart and it's uh, it's kind of raised so raised up, so you walk out the back door from the kitchen and it's it's highly elevated. So if the deck is falling apart, you can you 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 can request that that be replaced because it's a safety hazard, right? But That's a safety hazard. But yeah. but, the, but the seller doesn't have to. Re, re, repair it right is that true the seller can back out of the contract and say no i'm not doing it okay even though it's a safety hazard even though it's a safety hazard yeah the seller has no obligation nobody has obligations to do any repairs okay, okay. Right. um the buyer has no obligation to accept the property in that condition either okay um, so it would be a, it's a matter of choice and negotiation obviously um that is definitely a safety hazard i can tell you one thing if there's a loan involved uh the lender's not going to finance that house if there's a, any safety issues that have not been addressed okay once the appraiser comes around and he sees that deck you're done oh yeah all right thank you all right so um getting back to this we're a paragraph d we're talking about personal property okay so what i do when i'm looking up the personal property to see what comes with the property i go here appliances included okay and then there's there's the interior features as well, the ceiling fans. Um, uh, you know, sometimes it gives you know things in here as well, like like ceiling fans, right? That's part of the personal property, even though it's attached to the property. But what I do is I take these and I'll copy, and I'll come back over here and I'll paste. And I'll say, I used to do this a lot before, but I kind of know what's not in there now. And I'll be like, you know, I, I can tell from the photos that there is no there is no fridge right no fridge comes with it there's no fridge in the photos in the listing there's no fridge there's no fridge okay so even though it's in here i can line it out during the e sign part of it and i probably will and have my client initial but i've put it down here right the following items are not included in the purchase refrigerator okay so this right here, dishwasher, range, microwave. Okay, so I know the dishwasher is already here. I don't need it in here twice. So I'm gonna delete it, okay? And I know the range is right here. Again, doesn't need to be in there twice. Some people won't care. Some people will ask it to be removed. 
but the microwave is not up here in this personal property. Now it's attached to the property. Does it really need to be in here just to protect your client? Yes, I would, I would say put it in there, right? Refrigerator, everybody understands and knows it's not there. Some agents will try to be sneaky and be like, how am I gonna try to get the listing agent to buy me a fridge? <laughs> and then they'll, they'll just leave it in here. Uh, but you know, depending on who you're dealing with, that could potentially cause a problem later. So 270 is the price we're offering. Hey, right? Jeremy. Yes, sir. Real quick, don't forget to talk about washer and dryer. Yeah. That's, it's not something. included in that list. Yeah, so washer and dryer. Thank you, Freddie. Washer and dryer is not included in this list. Obviously for this purchase, it's not included in this list either for the appliances that are included, but let's say it was. So if you wanted to make sure that it stays in there because it's in that list or the buyer likes it, you know, hey, the washer and dryer looks good. I don't own a current washer and dryer. Let's put it in there. Let's part of, make it part of the negotiation. We could even put the fridge in there too, right? And make that part of the negotiation as well. Okay. That's a great point, Jeremy. Yeah, just because it's not listed in there, the buyer can ask for it on the offer. All right, so here we go. 270,000 is the offered purchase price, okay? Uh, initial deposit. One of these two, well, Let's start off with what I tell folks is, is typically an acceptable, and it's all negotiable, typically an acceptable initial deposit is 1% of the purchase price. So in this case, $2,700. Now if it's all cash, which that's the type of offer we're writing, maybe you wanna make it a little more competitive. Maybe you wanna put 10% down. Some banks back in the, foreclosure boom, 2008, 2009, they, for all cash transactions, they would require 10% down. Okay. But we're just going to put 1% for now. Um, I always, always, always check this second box because if you check this box, then you need to send the wire over with the offer, which I don't know who's going to accept it because you don't, you're not going to open escrow for something that's not under contract. Okay, so I always check the second box. And then even though there's already a three, if left blank, then three days after the effective date, I still put in three. Okay, I try hey, to Jeremy, real quick. So when if that a company's offer, let's say the buyer was under contract with another seller, and that deal got squashed, and the title company is still holding that escrow deposit then you can actually say a company's offer and it's being held by whatever title company. Ooh, good point. I didn't even think that. So let's say a title company is still holding on to the buyer's escrow from the previous transaction that did not close and they got out of it. And the buyer said, you know what, hold on to it. I'm going to be putting another offer in another contract and I'll just switch it over to that contract. Um, then you can use it as a company's offer. Okay. Cause it's already in escrow. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Freddie. Um, so down here we're at, and, and I use these as like a little cheat, the little asterisk is where something needs to be filled out or something could be filled out or a box needs to be checked or something like that. So if I'm going through the contract quickly, uh, down in the lower parts, I'm looking for the asterisk to know if there's something that needs to be filled out there and I'm not leaving any blanks. I'm not leaving if possible, I'm not leaving any blanks and I'm always checking some option of the boxes, right? So then I come over here and it's customary in Central Florida for the listing agent or the seller to pick the title company. If the seller picks the title company, then the seller pays for their portion of the title insurance policy. If the buyer picks the title company, then the buyer pays for the seller's title insurance, which could be a negotiating benefit, right? Um, and then they pay their own plus the lenders. Okay. So, you know, to find the title company information, oh, Janice, oh, terrible. What is this? Normally for the seller's preferred closing company, it's right here. Um, so I'm going to make so much fun of her when she gets home and it's always consumer title. That's the company that we use when we're on the listing side or when the or when we're representing the buyer and the, the listing agents like, hey, I don't have a preferred title company. Who do you recommend? I always say consumer title. 
Um, that's the one that HomeSmart is partnered up with or affiliated with, and they just do a fantastic job. So this is not really their contact information, but I'm just going to plug it in because it's easy and it's something that comes up when I click it. So, okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Additional deposit to be delivered to the escrow agent within blank days. So this would be, let's say you did 2,700, but then you're like, well, we'll do a seven day home inspection period. And then after that, after 10 days, we'll give another $2,700 to let them know, eh, we're serious. After the home inspection, we're really serious about this. We're all cash. We're ready to close. Let's go. Okay. Finance and express is a dollar amount. Here we're going to put in zero because it's all cash. Here again, no blanks, right? NA, zero. Okay. So then this is what my client's bringing to the closing table plus closing costs. Okay. Anytime I'm talking with a buyer, I'm writing up an offer that that's what I'm educating. This is what you're bringing to closing plus closing costs. Well, how much are closing costs? I don't know but I will get that information to you, okay? This box here is how many days they have to accept the offer. What I typically put in is today plus two, okay? Hey, Jeremy, can you run real quick through what a financing looks like? With Switch the it from cash, the, the numbers? Absolutely. So just, that, just so they can see that the uh, that form simplicity will actually do all the math for them, If but wow. they have to plug in the number. So let's say it's financing, can you do it? Absolutely, absolutely. So right here, financing expressed as a dollar amount or percentage. So listen to the words there. You you can do a dollar amount. So meaning, how much are they financing? Maybe they're just financing straight one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They're bringing the rest to closing. So that's one hundred and fourteen thousand six hundred dollars. Okay. Let's say they're doing an eighty twenty loan. They're taking a loan for eighty percent, and they're getting financing. They're putting down 20%. They're getting financing for 80%. So it will do the math for you automatically, but you have to put in the percentage symbol. Or if you just put in numbers, it's assuming you're talking about a dollar amount. So if I go back and take out the percentage, it assumes I'm talking about 80 bucks. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. But for a cash, we're just going to put in zero there. So it calculates everything properly. Okay. We gave until September 23rd, 2022 for them to accept the offer. Otherwise, this offer is no good. Okay. They can't just sign it and send it back after the 24th or 23rd. Jeremy, is this a normal in Florida to add this date? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. We don't add in Illinois because it's open. Like, you know, whenever seller wants, they respond or. <laughs> But they can and, and they can cancel and writing at any time. So let's pretend that the date is the 23rd. My buyer goes out and finds something that they like more. I'm emailing the listing agent saying, hey, uh, offer's dead. They're, they're not pursuing it. They found another property that I like better. Please disregard you know, the offer. They're not, they're not going to move forward with it. Okay. Hey, Daya, just real quick. Um, if, if you're in negotiations with the seller or the seller's agent and that offer has expired, yeah. you can always change it and have initials be put on it. You oh, know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. But yeah. the purpose of it is to bring the seller to action. Hey, we want an answer. You know, we don't want to sit around for a week, wait until you get all your offers and figure it out. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Actually, in Florida, we don't have that, but I know it's really good. I, uh, it helps everybody. Yeah. You know, like from the flip side of that too, from the listing agent side, I always tell my people, like if they put a really short date, like they put today by five o'clock, they'll write that in, right? And I'd be like, are they really not going to be interested if we sign it and send it back to them tomorrow? More than likely, they're still going to be interested. They just don't want to give us a chance to generate multiple offers. That's right? a great point, Jeremy. Yeah, so, don't, don't let that date deter you. Do what you got to do to make the deal happen, right? On either side. So um, closing, you know, I'm going to write up a cash offer different than I'm going to write up a finance offer. If the property is vacant, which obviously this one is, um, I'm going to make it as sweet as possible because I'm coming in $5,000 less. My people are living in an Airbnb right now. Of course, this is just a completely made up scenario. So I'm just going to say, yep, the seventh. 
And when I send it over to the listing agent, I'm going to make it clear that, hey, they're ready to close as soon as the title company is ready to close after the home inspection is done and there's no issues found. Okay. So if the title company is not ready to go at the seventh, we're still writing up an extension, of course, but um, that's, you know, it makes it a sweeter offer because these people are just paying for this property to be vacant right now. Um, occupancy and possession. Again, I'm looking over here. So I know that the property is vacant. So this box right here, checked if subject to lease or occupancy after closing, this does not apply to the owner occupying the property after closing, just like if it's a lease situation. Okay, it even says that down here. This does not, if this is, if, if this is for the owner, use the uh, post-closing possession, the U post-closing possession occupancy by seller. Okay, 83. All right, I see the asterisk, 84. Okay, so buyer may assign and therefore be released. I don't like that one. I won't accept that one. Um, buyer assign and will not be released of liability. That would be a good one if somebody's like putting it into an LLC that they don't have established yet. And then this one's my fave, may not assign this contract. If this box is checked, the buyer may not assign this contract. All right, pretty straightforward. So that would just be a regular Joe Schmo buyer. You know, I want to buy it. I want to put it in my name. I want to live here. They want to put it in a trust or an LLC. Box two would be the better box to check. Okay. Unless they already know the LLC and they're already putting it from the get go in the LLC. Okay. All right. So this is cash. We're checking this bad boy up here. Therefore, all of this stuff right here, 89 down this paragraph right here, we're not, we're not going to be using. We're not going to be filling out. Okay. But as I said before, I don't like blanks. So I'm doing all this. Okay, let's go. All right, again, looking for little asterisks on the side. I don't see anything. Ooh, 132, 132, 133. Assumption of existing mortgage, C rider D. I never use this one. Purchase money, note, and mortgage to seller. Now, as, as the interest rates go up, this could be starting to be used again, right? The assumption of existing mortgage. If the mortgage is assumable and the seller is willing to take on that risk, that liability, maybe that's something they're willing to do. You know, so if they're willing to do uh, seller financing, or you know, mortgage assumption, maybe they got an interest rate at three percent. They got to move. Somebody else, you know, can't afford it. Like that, that could sweeten the deal. Okay, but for now, let's not make it too complicated because that's a whole nother discussion. All right, now down here, asterisk one forty over here. What in addition to all of these things is the seller paying? Typically, write in NA down here. Remember, I'm representing the buyer. Okay, so I'm going to put 350. Ooh, I'm going to put $800 transaction transaction fee to HomeSmart. Why did I put $800? Who pays an $800 transaction fee on this call? Anybody? Bueller? We, we do. You do? Man, you gotta look over your ICA, brother man. So no, no one does. 350. 350, right? Unless it's the first transaction, 645, your additional risk reduction. But 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 you can charge whatever you want. Okay. You you work at hundred percent brokerage. Yes, you pay a transaction fee, but you can have them pay whatever transaction fee you want. This is considered to HomeSmart additional commission. So if you get a referral fee and you charge $1,000 for the transaction fee, then you get a thousand extra dollars plus whatever commission, let's say this one's 3%. So you get 3% plus a thousand dollars. You don't have to charge what HomeSmart's charging you, but that's what most agents do, okay? But understand HomeSmart views it as additional commission. If you're closing a deal with Op City or let's just say a referral agent, that 350, that thousand, that 800, whatever you charge on top of the percentage that you're getting from the listing agent is considered additional commission. 
it doesn't go and cancel out your transaction fee and then it's not part of the total commission. It's part of the total commission. Does everyone understand that? You can put whatever you want here, including zero. Yeah, I just wanna, just a clarity. So anything earned with your real estate license is commissions. Even if they call it a transaction fee, an admin fee, anything in Florida that's earned through a real estate license is considered commission. Okay, even if it's a brokerage fee or transaction fee, I don't care what you call it. Um, almost every brokerage has a fee that's charged to the agent and then the agent usually passes it on to the consumer, depending on the consumer as well, you know. You don't have to charge it, but it is negotiable and you can charge it. I would like to see the, the companies with the bigger splits, the 80-20 and 70-30 and stuff like that. Uh, buyer to pay 70% uh, of my, or 30% of my commission to its own smart. Anyway. You know what I also see here that's pretty prominent here in Central Florida and, and, and other parts of Florida is the listing agent will add his fee to the commissions earned. So in other words, he'll charge it to the buyer's agent. So I've seen they're offering 3% to the buyer's agent minus 295 or 350. So it'll be 3% minus 350 to the buyer's agent. Okay, right. so that's, that's more, another that's another way of offsetting the cost to yourself as well. That's more of a Tampa thing. I hardly ever see that in Orlando unless it's a Tampa agent. Oh, there you go. Okay. I know. So just, just you know, uh, Jerry has a question. Is it ever charged to the seller? Absolutely. Whenever I list a property, you can do whatever you want, though. Whenever I list a property, I do my commission plus 350 plus 500, whatever I'm, if I'm feeling froggy that day, you know, and then they say, oh, will you come down on your commission? I'll be like, hmm, hmm. Well, what, what advertising would you like me to take out of the marketing plan? I'll be like, you know what? I'll tell you what I can do. Um, we, th this transaction fee, I'll pay for that. I'll take care of that. And then I'll cross it off. And then we both initial. And then they feel like they want something. So the title company pays you a higher commission to net the percentage you pay to the broker? Hmm, no, that's not correct. Um, LeMay, are you or Lee Ray, are you in a place that you can unmute? Because I don't I don't understand your question. Yes, I am. Okay. So I just I didn't understand um, that buyer pay 800 to the transaction fee to Home Smart. So it sounded to me your explanation was that because it because this contract does, I'm brand new, you guys. So oh, no, I know. Um, so it sounded to me like since they do that that addition on the side that that's why you would put that in there is to compensate um, what you're paying to your broker. But I guess I misunderstood it. So the answer is no. Well, not that you had put in something about the title company. It's not, it's not the title company. It's the broker, right? You offset what you're paying your broker. Okay. Or to. So the, the, you're the saying the seller pays for that. You put that in there. So then the seller is essentially paying your piece that you're paying to your broker. If you put it as part of the contract. Yes. I, I, I don't want to get it twisted. Some people view it as that. I view it as I want extra commission. Okay. okay. That's the bottom line, right? Because if you don't want to pay your $350 transaction fee and you put it in the listing agreement or the sales, the purchase and sales contract, then you're negated from, not really negated, that's additional commission that goes towards paying fees. Right. So um, obviously, if you haven't paid your your monthly fees or you got that risk re reduction or you're paying a referral fee to another agent or something like that. And again, you can charge whatever you like. This was foreign to me when I moved down here from Illinois, because like we don't charge buyers anything. Right. We get what we get and then we pay our broker from that. Right. That's the norm. So the norm down here, at least in, in central Florida. And most, eh, right, pretty most parts of Florida is that you are charging your client buyer or seller a transaction fee in addition to commission. Gotcha. So that I didn't understand that um, when you were showing me how to walk through the contract. I was 
it was my understanding that that would be if um, it was a listing agent and you put that down there. So that I didn't get. Okay, so now I understand it. Thank you. Yeah. And I know right. for, for a seller, if, if you scroll up a little bit, Jeremy on your slide. Yeah, so there's cost to be paid by seller. You know, I'm very, I, I'm not gonna, if I'm already charging a 6% commission to the seller, do I wanna add any more to that? You know, it, it may ruin the listing. So you gotta be careful with that. Or you can use it as a negotiating point. Hey, listen, I charge 6% and my broker charges a transaction fee. I'll waive the transaction fee. How's that? Um, so that they feel like they're getting something special, which they are. All right, so that's for seller. And then for buyer, like I said, this is not mandatory. Or like Jeremy saying, this is totally if you want to earn more commissions on the deal mm -hmm. or you're trying to, or you're trying to offset some of your costs on the deal. Gotcha. Okay. Um, because at the end of the day, we charge you and then it's up to you where the money comes from. You can take it out of your commissions or you can charge it to the buyer or seller. Gotcha. Okay. So hey, this, I how often do you see this out of curiosity on contracts? Every day. Okay. Yeah. So now uh, you'll see brokerages don't include it in their contract. And then all of a sudden it shows up on the closing statement. Yeah. Um, I, I have come into the practice where I want you guys to put it on, disclose it right from the contract, right from the get-go, right from the beginning. So, because I have seen where it goes to the closing table and the buyer's like, Hey, where'd this 350 come from? Or where'd this 800 come from? You never told me about this. And it's on the closing statement. So it is being disclosed, but at the time of closing, not at the time of contract, I prefer, you guys do it right from the get-go. It's right on the contract. Everything's disclosed. The buyer signed it. Good to go. Does the listing does the listing agent need to know what we're paying as a transaction fee as part of the commission statement? No. Okay. But your the this contract, the only parties to this contract are buyer and seller, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, we're not signing this contract. The listing agent is not signing this contract. Yeah, we're listed on it as facilitators of the contract, but we're not a party to the contract. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, well, okay. So in the case when Jeremy was walking me through the contract, when I talked to him last, um, I am the buyer, but I'm also the, the buyer's agent. So I kind of felt weird doing that just because I am a, a party to the contract. So I didn't do well, that. Well, that, that only means you're gonna charge yourself, right? <laughs> Yeah, if you're, I, well, if you're the buyer and you're the buyer's agent, then that mm -hmm. means you're charging yourself that 350 transaction. So, I mean, at the end of the day, six of one and six of the other, you're still going to pay, right? Anyway. Exactly. Okay. Right. Okay. Got it. So this is just a kind of a reinsurance then that the buyer pays you essentially in a way, right? It's a yes, no. It's a disclosure. If you're not going to do it here, you need to do it in a buyer's agreement. Gotcha. Oh, it's so an either or situation. Right. Yeah, we don't like I said, we don't want you going to the closing table and it being disclosed on the closing statement and the buyer not knowing about it. Gotcha. Okay, so yeah, we a hundred percent of the time do agreements in Illinois. So we want to um, we want to disclose right from the beginning of the transaction. If you see some type of a, a a reaction from the buyer, then you can waive it. You can negotiate it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you can make, hey, look, this is what it is. But if I'll take care of you, and now you look like a, a rock star. No, I totally understand it. Got it. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sorry yeah, for taking I, I have time. a question. I have a question on that on that transaction fee. Uh, as a as an agent, uh, a realtor, you, you're gonna you're gonna pay taxes on that if you take it in commission, or you're gonna use it. You could use if you don't if you don't add it or don't collect it from uh, the the buyer or the seller. You know, whichever side you're representing. Uh, you collect it as a, if you do charge them for that transaction fee, you're going to, you're going to pay taxes on your total commission, right? But if you put it, if you don't collect it and you have it as an expense that you paid to HomeSmart, then it's a tax deductible expense. So is, has anybody ever, I'm not an accountant, but has anybody ever thought about that? The implication is it, it's almost like a wash, isn't it? Uh, I guess it depends on your tax bracket, but I'm, I'm not a tax professional either. It's just, you're making less money, right? Yeah, right. Again, it right. doesn't go and cancel out your transaction fee. It's total commission. And then, of course, if it's 350, 
or some, you know, what if somebody's charging a hundred bucks, right? It goes mm -hmm. towards the transaction fee, but it might not wipe it out completely. If you charge more than what HomeSmart is charging you, then, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's total commission. So right. you can throw it in there. You can not, you could say, hey, this is something that most, so you got to be careful with this, with anti-Sherman violation trust acts and everything like that. We can mm -hmm. say most agents that I know of are going to charge you this fee, but I'm going to waive it for you. That's mm -hmm. one of the benefits of dealing with me. But you yeah. got to be right? well, I've even I've even seen brokers try like put on the MLS is buyer's agent responsible for 350 transaction fee paid to blah blah blah. I've seen that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but Joe, to, to your point, num uh, yeah, I'm not an accountant. I'm not in a specialty on that. So I don't know if the numbers actually wash, but it's a good point. Yes, it is uh, gross commissions earned. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to go on an hour and a half <laughs> train. <laughs> we're, no good. we're only on page three, people. I love, love, love the questions, but let's let's save the questions until the end. So the people who have never been through this contract before and don't know how to write up a HOPA agreement and this and that, like, let, let's make sure we get through the whole thing, okay? All right. Um, so save your questions to the end or put them in the chat, please. One, line 168, seller designates the closing agent. This is the box that's typically checked, right? In Central Florida, if you're not doing Miami-Dade, Broward County, okay? This one down here, if you're in Miami-Dade, Broward County, okay, it says buyer shall designate the closing agent and seller shall furnish... A copy of the prior insurance policy and blah, 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 blah. So this is where different parts of Florida have different etiquette, okay? So if you're in Miami-Dade County, this is how it works. That's the box you're going to check. And if you're pretty much anywhere else, this is how it's, it's going to work. But it's always negotiable, okay? Um, let's see what else. So again, down here, I'm putting in zero because it's a blank, even though the box is not checked, Okay. So line 184, I'm always asking my people if they want home warranty. We have home warranty companies that we're partnered with. You can easily say, hey, this is a great way to minimize expense. Okay, you never know when you go get into when you buy a home that's a resale home, you could end up with unexpected repairs. Would you like a home warranty? Buyer pays for it, seller pays for it. NA, if they say no to it, okay. And then I'm leaving no blanks as well. Okay. Moving on down. See another checkbox. I see another asterisk. Okay. So special assessments. This is not for condo or homeowners association. This is special assessments it's added to the taxes. Okay. The house I just bought in Groveland has an SSA attached to the taxes. I pay more in my taxes because all the roads and the community development and stuff like that have been added to. The property tax okay instead of the purchase price so this one says that the seller shall pay installments due prior to closing and the buyer shall pay installments after the closing this one says it all better be paid off by the time i take the property okay so i've seen more investors check this box a normal transaction is what i would say is this box is checked Line 194, that's typically the acceptable. Now, if there is no SSA, it doesn't matter, right? I was fighting with this agent before, CDD. Down here, it's mostly called CDD. Up in Illinois, it's called SSA. But obviously, you got special service assessment. SSA makes sense. But down here, it's called CDD. So don't let it get you confused. Community uh, something development. CDD, yeah. Community development district. Yeah. Something like that. All right. Sorry, I drew a blank there. So now you got a bunch of pages of nothing. So see where it says disclosures, but there is one I'm going to stop because I think, people, oh, oh, just kidding. Okay. So 20 days here. I'm just putting in what they say. Okay. But I, instead of leaving it a blank, I put it in. So flood zone evaluation certification. So let's pretend you're on one of the coasts or near a body of water, and then you get the flood cert back and it says, hey, you need an additional $3,000 a year for flood zone coverage. And that throws their debt to income ratio out of whack. And now they can't afford the house. 
So this is what protects the buyer's earnest money from, from that happening. So if it's in a special flood hazard area, it needs to be figured out, insurance needs to be get, got and everything like that within 20 days after the effective date. Okay, energy brochure. So I'm not convinced. <laughs> I don't see all the files anymore, especially paperwork is doing a great job of taking care of everything. But, and we don't need to see this, but this is stating right here that every single person for every single contract, not newer homes, not older homes, every single home is receiving this energy brochure. Buyer acknowledges receipt of the Florida Energy Efficiency Rating Information Brochure required by section 553.996,F.S. Where is that? It's informed simplicity. I'm glad you asked. Okay. Lead-based paint. So if it's uh, 1978 or newer, lead-based paint disclosure, you should also give them the Protect Your Family brochure, which I don't think that's informed simplicity, but it's easily Googleable. Googleable. Is that a thing? That's a thing, right? Okay. More disclosures. It is informed simplicity. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah, you have a lead-based paint, uh, lead -based paint pamphlet. There we go. Pamphlet. That's what I meant. Protect your family from lead-based paint. Lead-based paint pamphlet. So I think 15 days is absolutely ridiculous from the effective date. It's really 16 days. You have more than two weeks to do an inspection on the property. Now, if you have well and septic and a home inspection and this and that, and it's more complicated, maybe you're going to use 15 days. Okay. But what I would recommend here is more seven or 10. Okay. Hey, just a quick point, Jeremy. Uh, please remember, guys, uh, that the all time stipulations on this contract, the as is, are calendar days, which means weekends and holidays are included. They count as days. Okay. Not business days. So it's not 10 business days, it's 10 calendar days. Yeah, all you Illinois people. Because Illinois is all business days. Walk through again. Looking for the asterisks. There's nothing there. I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling. If you want the full version of this with every paragraph explained, we have four hours worth of content that I could send you one video at a time. Not one video. I could send you all four links. It's four different videos um, where we go through every single line item of this and have it explained by attorneys. So, um, but this is more the quick and dirty. Hey, I'm going to show you how to fill it out. Okay. If you want the legal explanation for every single paragraph, then that's the videos to watch. Okay, lots of, there's nothing here. I'm looking for the asterisks on the side again. IRS, da da da. Okay, so now we need to figure out what needs to be checked here. So we look back over at this, we look at the listing, and we're looking to see, hey, does this have an HOA? If it's got an average monthly fee, chances are it does. If you scroll down a little bit to, where is it? Right here. Okay. Community information. HOA. Community HOA. Yes. It's monthly. 217. So we need one of these. Seller financing mortgage assumption, FHA. Are we doing an FHA offer or a conventional offer? I forget. It's cash. I thought, I thought we were doing cash. That wasn't a question for you, Freddie. It was a question to see if everybody else is paying attention. Okay, cash. I'm muting. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> short sale, not a short sale. Homeowners flood cert, right? Not in a flood zone. That should be disclosed. Uh, interest bearing account, you know, defective drywall, Lebe faint. Uh, when was this house built? I'm going to lead you to it. I want you to tell me when, though. Not you, Freddie. Love you, though. Built I'm in 94, so no. I, I almost spilled 94. the beans. I muted. <laughs> you muted it and said it out loud. <laughs> 1994, so we don't need this. Uh, housing for older people. We do need this. How do we know that? Plus 55. Yeah. So. Too many disclosures. We don't have this many in Illinois. <laughs> you do. They're just within the contract. And you initially have your client's initial if it's added. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So I think it's- Daya, you're lucky you're not in California. You should see theirs. <laughs> so how you know and how you can set up a search is housing for older people, okay? Or housing for older per is yes, okay? So that's how you know. Also, it's in the description, right? Pembroke Fairways gated 55 plus community, okay? So if you just search 55 plus, it may or may not come up if it's in the description, in this case, the legal description as well. Um, so yeah, you, you type in older, it comes up down here. Okay, housing for hey, older. Just a heads up, some associations are also 62 plus. Ooh, good to know. Okay. okay. So housing for older people, you check that box, you check that box. Rezoning, it doesn't matter how many times I do this. I, I typically go through every single one. Now I know the property is vacant, so I know they're not gonna be asking for a U addendum. Okay, let's say this property, uh, this buyer is my uncle. What addendum would I want to use for this one? Not you, Freddie. You have some relationship with the, the buyer, the seller. Yes, but which addendum? AA? Yes, AA. They try to make me go to rehab. All right. Wait, uh, yeah, Jeremy, yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, the ahead. addendums mu must match the contract, right? With the little letters at the bottom? Thank Is that you, still please. on? Yes, yes, yes. So um, what she's talking about here is when you there's there's multiple homeowners association addendums but there's only one b homeowners association addendum and it's going to say cr-6 at the bottom of that addendum this one too it's going to say q housing for older persons okay and then it's going to say cr-6 at the bottom okay this one too okay so the reason i keep bringing up cr-6 as well, you got six right here, as is six, okay? But if you look at the bottom of each addendum, it's going to say the CR-6. That's how you know it goes with this contract. If you use a different appraisal addendum it, it's, or appraisal contingency, it's, it's not going to align with this contract. It's going to be the wrong one, and paperwork department is going to make you redo it, and then you're going to look silly, okay? So don't do that. So we got all the ones checked at these features. Hey, Jerry. Yes, sir. Yeah, on the, uh, you have FHA VA financing. Is it assumed automatically that it's either cash or convention or do you put it on the other? Is it assumed? Oh, no, I don't, I don't, I already checked the box, paragraph eight. Yeah, up above. Yep. Okay, gotcha, okay. All right. That's how you know it's cash. Now you could, oh. if you really wanted to, if you thought the person was, I don't know, I mean, I let me go back to the financing terms on paragraph two. So Joe, to answer your question, yeah, yeah, I saw um, that. where we checked off cash, obviously yeah. it's going to be cash. We're not going to need right. any type of addendum for VA. Right. But if right. you go to the, if you check off convention, uh, you check off this contract with B, this contract is contingent upon financing. Mm -hmm. th then if you notice on sentence on line 90, it's making you choice. Conventional FHA VA. So right there is where you're disclosing what type of financing the buyer is using. Right, right. Yes. And okay. just a quick heads up on this: if your lender and the buyer decide to choose a, a different loan uh, towards the middle or the end of the transactions, in other words, they're switching from FHA, FHA to conventional or conventional to FHA, something like that. Please make sure you disclose to all parties in the transaction. Okay, so. I want to go through the HOPA addendum and the HOA addendum and where to find those. So let's let's do that real quick. So to, again, to answer your question, Joe, we're not we're not going to put it in here. It's already been put in uh, paragraph eight. Okay. Right. All right. So that's that's pretty much it. You can put in the buyer's address, seller's address, you know that sort of thing if you really want to, but I never do. All right. So I'm afraid to look. We got six things in the chat here. Let's see. Oh. Le Lee Ray said, hey, hey, but she already used it. Yes. But make sure the denims match. Yes, yes. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, question, if you represent the buyer and the buyer is a relative, you need to add this. Yes, that's the AA addendum. So anytime you have interest in the property, meaning you're related to somebody in the transaction, the buyer or the seller, or it's yourself, you need to use the AA addendum. 
Okay. 1994. Okay, good. Uh, is there a special form we need to submit to the listing agent asking for inspection and repairs? No form. Um, we just, we have a blank addendum that we write up that's on the required documents form under RSA. So if you go into RSA on the left-hand side, you click on downloads, you type in required and I'll have that addendum. I think it's like the ACSP, something like that, ACSP, something like that. Uh, we just, we yeah. all call the the blank addendum. Uh, Jeremy, I believe there is one. For repairs? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, I, I pulled it up the other day. I've included it before. Let me let me tell you which one it is. So actually, there, there's a form in Form Simplicity and in Transaction Desk. It's called a, re, a buyer's request for repairs and or remedies. There you go. That one. And if, yeah, open that one up. Good. Yeah, buyer's request for repairs and or remedies. You open that up. And that's just a notification from the buyer to the seller asking for certain repairs. Um, and you'll notice here that the top one says general repairs. And the second one says, uh, there's, you, at least there used to be lender repairs, lender required repairs. Scroll down a little bit, um, Jeremy, please. Yeah, it used to say lender required repairs. Um, like for the example, Joe, that example about your deck in the back. That was a safety issue. That's definitely a lender required repair because it's a safety issue. So uh, I would put it in there. Um, scroll down a little bit further, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, they changed it. It used to say buyer, uh, just put it under the general repairs on top, the first paragraph. And you could actually put the words lender required. Cool, so you learn something new every day. At least I did today. Okay, so the one that I use for pretty much everything. Now, wait, let me clarify. This is only the request from the buyer to the seller. If there is an agreement on certain repairs, then you would use the addendum that Jeremy's talking about. So this is the request from the buyer to the seller saying, hey, there's some things I want you to address. Can we work on these things? And then if the seller signs off, that means they agree to everything on that list. If not, they can negotiate. And then, um, and then you would use this addendum to contract, which is basically just a blank addendum where you would write in the verbiage of what's been negotiated. Now, this is the only addendum that you would use with the as is that doesn't have the CR-6 on the bottom, okay? So you put, you know, the addendum number, the effective date, so whatever the effective date was, if they receive the offer today, they send off on it tomorrow, the effective date would be tomorrow, okay? And then you type in whatever you want. So they're requesting, right? Now you have to be careful how you do this, right? Because if, if there's a lender involved and you're doing a credit instead of the repairs, you can't say in lieu of repairs because the lender's gonna be like, whoa, what repairs? And the whole transaction is gonna fall apart. Yeah, and the lender will not lend money against repairs either. All right. So you want to write this up as a closing cost credit. Unless it's like an FHA 203K, which is repairs and stuff. So it's, it all depends on the loan. But yeah, typically they don't want to see repairs. Okay. To get back to the addendums. So for the most part, with the exception of the AA addendum, the two addendums that we brought up should be attached to the listing under this little paper clip. If you're using some form of the matrix, it probably looks very similar to this, okay? So you click on the little paper clip. It says CR-6, Q, housing for older people. And then seller's property disclosure. Where's the homeowner's associate? Maybe it's in with this one, who knows? Let's see. There's just page one here. So we don't have an HOA at that number. Ah, this listing agent must be new. So this should be filled out a little bit more. This is the wrong name. It should say AJX FL LLC, AJX Homes FL LLC. And then, you know, you, you put your buyer's name in here. You have your buyer initial. Obviously, it should be initial by the seller, too. This is kind of laughable. And if it's a 55 or older or 62 or older, what Freddie just educated us on today, that proper box should be checked. Okay. So we have that one. We will then download it. I had this question the other day, so I wanna show you all how to do it. We're gonna download it. 
Then we're going to upload it. So we go back to the transaction. Okay, I typically hit the back button, but if you're in a different page, like you're in the contract or something like that, and you're like, oh, how do I, how do I get back there? Number one, you want to make sure you save. Get the save button up here, save. Okay. And then you get out of this, you put in transactions. Okay. Then you go to my transactions. Freddie and I got to jump on another Zoom. All right. Then you go back into it here at 717 Glen Oaks Drive. Okay. That's that's another way to get back into it. So any addendum that you pull off, you hit upload over here from my local device. I'm gonna do this one here, save files. You could do multiple as well. So I had the one and I can grab the others, seller's property disclosure. What are we missing, team? What is not on here? HOA. HOA, thank you, Tom. Okay. And this one's filled out. Let's see if it's got the proper name at the top. No, no, no name. No name needed. Thank you. All right. So seller's property disclosure. Again, we go in the same way. Upload files. My local device. It's right there. Save. Okay. We select this bad boy. We can't fill these out once we upload them. All we can do is edit them through the e sign. Okay, so you see the, you see where it says e sign down here, right there. Now, if I didn't have that option because I've never used this before and I haven't paid for the e sign yet, up here in the top right hand would be would say upgrade. Okay, you click on the upgrade, you pay your seventy two dollars for the year depending on when you're watching this. And then that's how you do it. So you hit e-sign, you select, okay. It's just showing me the agents, right? I'm not gonna send it to Janice. I'm gonna, uh, I don't really need that, but create, create a new session, okay? Now there's a way to add your buyer so you don't have to keep on adding them every single time. So let's just go in through this to show you exactly what it is. So we're gonna call this 717 Glen Oaks contract. I know, creative, right? Uh, so Renee, there we go. Just let me know if you have any questions. All right. Go to next. All right. Okay, so it's just showing me right now. I gotta add my buyer, Renee Kelly. So add signer, Renee Kelly. Renee Kelly.com. I like it. Okay, so now who's gonna sign now? I don't need to sign anything here because there's no lead-based paint. I think I might need to sign an FHA addendum as well, but I don't need to sign anything. So we're just gonna select Renee Kelly. Okay, hit next. Okay, my buyer one is Renee Kelly. Okay, seller one, seller two. Okay. There are signing locations that are not assigned to or assign to a signer would you like to continue and remove those signing location templates so what it's talking about is the seller because it auto fills those in but we don't have a seller so we, yes we want to we want to move forward with that okay so we want to select these three contracts these three agreements right and again we're missing the, the hoa right and there's a spot in this contract that says do not sign this contract unless you've received and reviewed the hoa addendum okay so then you go through now, if if the contract was in here before, it's gonna standard just add these things to it. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to change anything. Now let's say there is no fridge included and you've read that and you know that and you wanna line out the fridge. This is how you do it, okay? So there's gonna be a line through the fridge, it's gone. Okay, that's how you line the stuff out. You wanna save, 
your markup progress. Because if you're going through this and you're adding everything and then you lose internet, you're driving down the road, whatever the case may be, trying to do this as you're driving, well, hopefully you're in the passenger seat, uh, you lose it, then it's gone, all right? But now we got it saved, so we're good. So you save it just by clicking this little bad boy over here. First 12 pages, we don't need to worry about because it's already in there. Unless you want to add initials for some reason somewhere. Okay, but I know I don't and we're running out of time, so I'm just skimming through it here. Okay, so seller's disclosure. We need to add everything here. You see that? Seller, bam. Okay, now it says JP. I don't know why. I put in RK, not JP. So I'm going to switch it to RK. See that up here where I'm doing that? RK. Okay, down here, bam. Go to the next. They're investors, they're not disclosing anything. We don't know anything. We just renovated the property. We don't know anything about it. All right. Adding initial on the bottom of each page. And I got myself in there. So at the end, it's probably gonna say, yo, Jeremy, you need to sign this too. Okay. Um, so then Renee Kelly needs to sign the buyer right here. I do the print. And I say, I'm gonna make it required. So they have to print their name right there. Require, save, I add the date, boom, date and time. Oh, I almost missed that one. Gotta add it on the bottom of each page. Now, even though the seller didn't sign this, I'm gonna put it in, okay? So I'm gonna put in RK right there. I'm even gonna add the little checkbox because you know what? My client, Renee Kelly, she's she's 55. I mean, she looks 35, maybe 25. But you know, I want to make sure we're good on this, right? That that it's not even though they didn't check a box, she's barely 55, so she barely qualifies to live in this community. Um, if it's 62 or older, like it's a no go. So I want to make sure we're just not leaving this out there for for anybody, right? And that's it. That's that. I'm gonna finish this up. I hit next a bunch of times. Okay, go. Oh, so well, let me move on because I got Jeremy Porter over here and Jeremy Porter hasn't signed or initialed anything. So I'm just gonna hide my initials somewhere on the bottom of a page that nobody cares about. There we go, okay. If you don't do that, then as far as I know, you need to go through and, and delete it and everything like that. So, all right, so we hit next, we hit next. That's just to go through and then preview everything. We're just gonna assume everything's right. And then we finish it. We're like, yes, finish him. You hit finish, it emails to all parties. Now, I don't think I picked the right ones. You can do it to where it emails it to one party at a time. So it's gonna send it to Renee Kelly first. Uh, then it's going to send it to me after she signs it. But I didn't check the little bubble at the beginning uh, where we went into it. I can do it real quick here and show you. Let's go through this again. Okay, so I'm going to pick this, pick this. It's in the email section. Okay, you hit e sign. Okay. Move this, create new session. Oh, I should have done new eSign 2.0. That's definitely a, a, a better version. It goes through a lot less questions. Um, but anyway, see where it says, send to all signers at once. So apparently now that's the default. So it used to do, this was the default, send to one signer at a time, okay? So it's you wanna do send to all signers at once, that's my preference anyway, okay? And then you go through, go through, go through, okay? You can even have it repeat, send reminders. So if they haven't signed it, it's gonna send it to them every single day to sign. Okay, any questions? Well, we got five questions in the chat. Let's see what we got here. Gotta go make it a great week, everyone. Thank you, Freddie. See, I knew something. <laughs> Thank you, Carolina, I appreciate it.
Uh, Jeremy, like, where do you see all these recorded videos? Can you please share with me? Like, you know, I will go through it, different type of contracts and all. Absolutely. So I have, uh, we, here at HomeSmart, we created this video library. Um, been going on for about a year now. So we have uh, close to 100 videos, I think, in it. Um, they're all uploaded to home, or excuse me, to YouTube. Okay. So this is, and I keep adding to it. It's a Google Doc. So please, 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 if you want access to it, just send me an email outside of this. Like, don't send your email to the chat because I want to have access to it when I hang up. Uh, so just send me an email to the email that I sent you this morning about the contract training. I'll invite you to this. Um, and it's easy peasy. Okay. Thank and I, up, I update this as we go, as we add more and more videos and everything like that, I, uh, I put them in here. Okay. Any other questions? Questions, questions, questions? No? Did I cover all the, the questions in the chat? Let me see. All right. Is it mandatory for investors to also fill out the seller's disclosure? Only if they're listed with a HomeSmart agent. Okay. So it is absolutely mandatory for HomeSmart agents to have their clients fill out the seller's disclosure because it shows that you asked them. So it protects you from liability. Okay. So if it's our listing, if it's a home smart listing, yes, it is definitely required. If it's actually attached to another listing that's not ours and the buy and the seller's listing agent is requesting it, then the buyer should fill it out and sign it as is received. Another question is, is it common to list the seller's name on the listing in Florida? Uh, yeah, because the, um, the general public can't see it. It's just, I mean, I, I've, I've seen that in Illinois too, where they, they're like uh, confidential or it could be you or, you know, they'll, they'll do some, some funny things down here, but it's just like the, the buyer can't see any of this stuff is down, right? And if I really want to know the seller's contact information, I'm just going to the tax records when I'm filling out the contract anyway. So what are you, what are you protecting? What are you keeping confidential when it's not confidential, it's public record? That's my viewpoint. Yeah, the only time you will you will see it uh, like on a, a public website, a county website, that it's blocked or something. If it's a special agent or an attorney of some sort or something like that, and they'll, it'll be listed under something else. And that's very rare, very rare. Yeah, I used to do the OOR thing, owner of record, um, but again, down here it's you know it's public. I'm sure it's, it's public where you're at too. Right. If you look up the tax records, it's right there. Unless it's like a recent buyer and the tax records haven't uh, been up to date yet. Right. Like it's a flip and they flipped it a month ago or something. Yeah. I, I think it's silly. Like some agents will put in like confidential and then you click over to the tax records and it's right there. It's like, um, it's not that confidential. So, um, so yeah, we just, we just put it in our listings. So you could put, I've seen some agents try to be cute, could be you. And then the buyer writes up the offer and it says, could be you. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. I'm going to let you all get back to your life. I'm so sorry. We did go about an hour and a half today. But before I let you go, is there anybody else who has any questions for me before or Friday before we go? Okay, then without further ado, I'm going to release you back into the world so you can go sell some houses, do what you're best hey, at. Real quick, um, no, I think there is a uh, drive to five training today, Jeremy, is that right? Let's find out. So how would I know how to find this, Freddie? I, I never know how to find any of the trainings that unless Jeremy sends me an email, I don't know when these trainings are. The easiest way is go to homesmartcalendar.com. Or, or, go to, or, or go right into your real smart agent. You need to go into your real smart agent? What about this view calendar thing? Yeah, you can just go to home. Yeah, you can click on there. Exactly. What is um, I would choose Florida. to Select one on the top there, Florida. Choose by state. Yeah. Boom. And then, so what do we have today? All right. 
I think drive to five at home smart marketing. Yeah, yep. we have drive to five at 12 p.m. Roadmap to success. They're going to be talking about how to create and execute your own 30, 60 and day, uh, 30, 60, 90 day social media marketing plan. And then again, at two o'clock, you'll have another uh, segment, which is luxury social media marketing with Adam Bauer, our marketing, uh, the president of, mar of our marketing department. So you have two uh, trainings today, drive to five, roadmap to success. I know you like to operate in the future, but um, we're on the 21st. So oh my gosh, you're right. That is the 28th. I apologize. It's actually tomorrow, the 22nd. Sorry, the 22nd, tomorrow. Rudy is so far ahead of us. He's already on tomorrow. He's like, it's the 20. He just wants to get to the weekend. So um, yeah, so exactly what Freddie said, but tomorrow instead of today, we do have uh, HomeSmart is putting on a training um, for right right here, okay? The Marketing and Design Center. So how to really do the, do the basics, the business cards, the yard signs, the marketing material, digital content. It's a ton of great information. If you haven't gone in and played around with it, you should. If you haven't attended the training or seen the pre-recorded video of this, you should. There's a lot in there that you have no idea that you have access to. Okay, so one more thing. So you have the drive to fives tomorrow. And then um, on Friday, don't forget one o'clock Eastern time, we have our smart Zoom. And um, we actually have uh, our, uh, one of our departments actually teaching us all the free tools that HomeSmart offer you guys and how to use them. So if you guys are wondering how to use your CRM, your website, how to do flyers, any of that type of stuff, uh, we're going to be showing you guys on Friday at one o'clock on the Smart Zoom. So look out for all those trainings coming up tomorrow and Friday. Very cool. And today. Friday, appreciate it. All right. Bye, everyone. Go sell some houses. <laughs>